If you play in an ESPN league or are thinking of joining an ESPN public league for fantasy baseball, stick around because I'm going to tell you how to nail the perfect draft. If you can't wait for draft season, guess what? You don't have to. Join Underdog Fantasy and you can draft right now for MLB Best Ball for the 2024 season. They've got some new contests that just opened up. Check them out right now. If you sign up and use promo code ENDGAME, you get a 100% deposit match for your first $100 that you put into your account. Try Underdog Fantasy today. Like on most platforms, you can choose if you want to play Roto, points, head-to-head, however you want to do it. There's so many ways to play fancy baseball, which is what makes it so great. But the default setting for ESPN is different than on the others because it does right now default to head-to-head points. And that matters a lot. I told you on my mistakes to avoid when you're drafting is not knowing your league settings because there's a huge difference, which is why the ADP on ESPN is going to look a lot different than it does on Yahoo or any other site. If you want to know the details of how it works and what ESPN's default scoring is, well, you can go check that out on their site. But let me just tell you that the way I'm breaking down this perfect draft is from the standpoint of their default, which is a 10-team points league head-to-head. So here we go. So in round one, who should you target? I mean, you can't go wrong with any of the choices there. Juan Soto would be nice if you have the number one or two pick, but let's assume that you don't. And in that case, let's go with a standby, Jose Ramirez. You can't go wrong with him in this format. Now he's been a first rounder in any format the last few years. Slipped a little bit last year, and so that's why, for the most part, in Roto Leagues, you'll see him now as my early second, mid-second round pick. But in this format, he's a first rounder, and the reason is plate discipline. That's what makes Jose Ramirez so valuable. Yeah, he gets you home runs and stolen bases. If you're playing points, that is, well, it's still important, but those categories specifically aren't as important. It's the fact that he draws walks and he barely strikes out. His K minus BB percentage is zero. That's right. Last year, he struck out 10.6% of the time and he walked 10.6% of the time. That is impressive. There are very few batters who can keep their strikeout and walk rates close, much less dead even. And again, this is so important, which is guys like J-Ram, Alex Bregman, these players with superior plate discipline are so much more important in this type of format. So Jose Ramirez, first round, yeah, he deserves it. And then another little reversal here, a guy who's unanimous first round pick in almost every platform, but on ESPN, Julio Rodriguez, believe it or not, is available around pick 20. In fact, as of right now, I'm looking at his current ADP on ESPN, it's 23. Just a couple days ago, it was at 27. Why? Why so low? We've seen him go as high as number two overall in some leagues. Well, it's not like he has terrible plate discipline. It's just that those steals don't hold quite as much weight in this format. Batting average and just getting on base matters a little bit more. But still, we're talking about just a total stud here. And there's no reason to think he can't do better this year. This guy's coming off just one full season in the majors. Yeah, I think he's definitely worth a second round pick in any format. In fact, last year at the age of 22, he still finished 17th overall in points in this exact scoring system. So it's safe to say he's definitely worth a second round pick. And if he's there, I'm grabbing him. Then in round three, I'm going to grab another player that is going to be worth less in a points format, but I still think is being undervalued, Trey Turner. Now, the one concern here is that his batting average, which used to be superior, he was always among the league leaders just a couple of years ago, but last year dropped to 266. And he's not a player who draws a lot of walks. So his main appeal and is usually steals. Again, a little less important here, but still, this is a guy who can rack up points very easily. He's still a superior player. I do think he does better than last year. You know, he just got off to a very slow start. A lot of things going on. Remember, they didn't have Bryce Harper or Reese Hoskins. A lot of injuries in Philadelphia in the first half of the season. And I think Turner will get back maybe if he doesn't hit over 300. That wouldn't be surprising. But I think he does better than last year. And again, just too good of a value to pass up here. Then in round four, Austin Riley still available. Yeah, his ADP is 33 right now on ESPN. But I'll tell you, I did an ESPN draft. Just get a feel for how this format works. To be honest, I don't play a lot of ESPN leagues in fantasy baseball, but I just did one and I was able to get him and pick 39. So I know this is definitely doable. 
If you're playing in a 12-team league, you're not getting him in round four. But again, this defaults to a 10-teamer, so that's where I'm getting this from. You already know what Riley can do. He can mash. He's going to put up a ton of total bases in that lineup, runs, RBIs, you name it. So you already locked down a third baseman. Why not grab another with Riley? You can always slide one of them to your utility spot. And don't forget, Jose Ramirez might get some looks at second base this year, according to new manager Stephen Vogt. So you could slide him over at second and put Riley at third base. All right, it's time to grab a pitcher. Now, I'm going to go with Logan Gilbert of the Mariners. I'll tell you what, I really love George Kirby in this type of format because just so steady, consistent. is going to get you points. But you might notice that Kirby's ADP is almost a full round higher. Logan Gilbert wound up with the exact same amount of fantasy points as Kirby last year. They both got exactly 410 in ESPN scoring. And despite being slightly different types of pitchers, their production is almost identical. They're both guys who get right around 200 innings pitched. They're going to rack up wins, obviously being on the same team, same situation. Why not get the guy who's available around later? You really don't need an ace quite as badly if you don't consider Gilbert or Kirby guys like that an ace. I know some people do, but again, you're not looking for somebody to lead the way an ERA or whip or those single based categories. You're looking for total points, guys who can accumulate. I think any of these Mariners pitchers early on can do it. I'm going with a guy who's the best value in Gilbert at round five. In round six, is it too early for Yandy Diaz? It is not. You know the story here. Someone with impeccable plate discipline will walk a ton, barely strikes out. Even though he's not necessarily going to get you 30 plus or 40 home runs, it doesn't matter. Singles, doubles, home runs. He's going to give you a load of everything. He's going to get you points. He'll be out there every day. And that's what you're looking for. In fact, he might be undervalued still because he's not as exciting a name in roto, you know, category based scoring systems he's not going to be drafted nearly this high but he should be in a points league he was 22nd among all hitters last year that leads me to another guy who's maybe not the most exciting name but brian reynolds will get the job done for you again decent amount of power and some speed and will get you a fair amount of doubles which hey that works in this format i wish he was in a better lineup where we could feel like his run and rbi totals will be higher Hey, who knows? Maybe the Pirates will pull through this year. Round eight, time for another pitcher. This is a guy who I feel is just being undervalued in every format. Zach Eflin for Tampa Bay. Last year, he ranked 13th among all pitchers in ESPN scoring. So will he do better or was last year kind of his peak? Some people don't think he will repeat what he did last year. But why not? This was his first go in Tampa Bay. Don't need to explain how Tampa Bay has managed to work with all sorts of veteran pitchers and make them significantly better. Eflin is a guy who's always had the skills. The underlying metrics have supported this. He continues to get better with age. Why can't he do even better this year? Next, let's go back to the infield and Xander Bogarts, guy who right now I think, well, another shortstop. We already got Trey Turner. But don't forget, he's actually going to be the second baseman for the Padres this year. So it won't take more than a week or two, depending on your league's rules and where you play, before he's second base eligible. He's a career 291 hitter and, again, will draw walks, get base hits. He has gotten at least 250 total bases three straight seasons. And let's keep that theme going with another player who is... Going to be more valuable in this format, Brandon Nimmo of the Mets. Kind of like Bogarts, kind of like the Brian Reynolds. This is somebody who won't have elite power, really doesn't run at all, has never had even double-digit steals in his career. But he scores runs, he gets base hits, and he gets total bases. This is what we're looking for. A guy will accumulate stats across the board. Now, Nimmo actually did get his career high in home runs last year, which was 24. I don't know that he really has another gear for power. Even so, it would be very slight, but it doesn't matter. This guy is going to hit our top of the Mets order. He's going to get you base hits, runs, all of the things that will eventually wind up getting you points. He's one of those quietly productive players. And, of course, walk rate. 10% or better walk rate pretty much every year that he's a starter. Nimmo is solid, if not exciting. All right, now we can get a little bit more risky. We're in the double-digit rounds. Let's go for a pitcher with tremendous upside like Cole Reagans. 
I get that we've only really seen half a season's worth of what we imagine Cole Reagan is going to be this year. Is that enough? Well, at this point, we're talking about after pick 100. Yeah, the upside is definitely worth a draft pick here. Look, this is a player that has shown that he's developed quite a bit in his approach. Last year, he had five different pitches that he threw at least 10% of the time, and every one of them had a whiff rate of at least 23%. I have no doubt he'll continue to strike out batters in bunches, and he should be out there pretty much every fifth day. The only issue here is wins being on the Kansas City Royals. We'll see how that goes. But again, at this rate, you know, there's not a lot of pitchers who I feel better about. So I'm going to go with Reagans here. And then next pick, I'm going to go with another young pitcher who was very impressive in 2023, Tanner Bibby of Cleveland. ERA under three, a whip of 1.18. This is also a guy who has multiple pitches that are effective, extremely high run values on his fastball, his breaking stuff, and his off-speed stuff. So he doesn't just rely on one or two pitches. Cleveland's got a lot of talent in their rotation, but I don't think it's going to be long before we determine that Bibby is the ace of that staff. Now we're at around 13. Do we need a closer? Well, need is a strong word because, again, we're not chasing saves as a category or even holds, but they do count. Sometimes it's nice to have a guy who can get you points kind of steadily throughout the weeks, and you don't worry about giving you nothing in a week if he gets blown up in a start. At this point, it's kind of nice to see Paul Seawald available. There's really no competition for the closer job there in Arizona. It's his. This is a veteran guy I don't feel like is going to all of a sudden regress negatively. He's available pretty late here. He's going to get probably 30 plus saves easily. So it's going to be a nice source of points. And then let's round out the outfield with Seiya Suzuki of the Cubs. Another player I feel is just underappreciated because he doesn't stand out in any one area. But in this format, that's okay because what does stand out is the fact he had a 357 on base percentage last year, mainly thanks to a 10% walk rate. He's had some injuries that bothered him last year or so. And I think that if he is fully healthy, this Cubs lineup is still really solid. He could be even more productive this year. And then let's grab our catcher. Several rounds earlier, his brother, William Contreras, was going to be taken. Tempting to grab him, but why not wait until this point and get Wilson Contreras, another guy who is being undervalued and is definitely more valuable in this format. Last year, Contreras, Wilson, posted an ex-WOBA in the 93rd percentile. This is one of those players that in leagues that use OBP or points leagues like this, you're going to value a little bit more, but they don't seem to get a big bump in ADP. All right, but now I just can't resist. This is a player who's falling way too far, even though this is a points league, Jazz Chisholm. Look, we've got several players on a roster already who are pretty safe, high floor type of players, excellent play discipline. I mean, Jazz is not that. You don't make the cover of MLB The Show by being a safe player. He's flashy. He's talented. He's injury prone. He strikes out a lot, but... The talent is so immense. And look, this is a guy who could have huge spikes in production. He's got the power. He's got the speed. He's going to hit the top of the order. Yeah, there's some risk here. But again, we're looking around pick 150. Yeah, I'm going to take a chance on Jazz breaking out. All right, let's grab another pitcher on the Mariner staff. You got so many choices there. I love Bryce Miller. I've talked about him several times this season. It still surprises me that he's going so late. I get it that he's young and he's still got something to prove. I think he's going to prove it this year, so I have no qualms about taking him. All right, let's go a couple more rounds here. At 18, I like TJ Friedel for the Reds. Look, he's slated to lead off on that talented lineup. Last year, had 18 home runs and 27 steals. He's already got four steals this spring. He's going to run a lot. He's going to score a lot. And so even though he's not the personification of a points player, he's somebody who's going to get you a lot of production in spurts. Now, next up, let's talk about a player who maybe at this point in his career, his best ability is his availability, Justin Turner. Maybe not what he used to be, but he should play a large role for the Blue Jays this year. He's going to be your utility player. He can qualify at pretty much every infield position, and you can even put him in the outfield. Does not strike out very much and still showed he has quite a bit of power. I think going to the Blue Jays in that lineup should help him, if anything, A little long in the tooth, but still, we're looking for a utility player with upside. Turner is it. 
And then round 20, we can go a lot of directions here. Let's fill out the bench, get another outfielder who can slot in multiple positions, Chaz McCormick. It would be nice to see him cut down on his K rate a little bit, but he does walk a fair amount. He's going to be out there every day, it looks like, for the Astros this year. can play left center and right field, and I think he's going to play an important role in this lineup. He's going to accumulate a lot of runs and RBIs, got some power, got some speed, a little bit of everything. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is in a scoring format like this just to be out there, to accumulate those at-bats, to be available. That's my perfect draft if I'm doing an ESPN standard league. If you draft on Yahoo or you're curious what the difference is, well, here's my perfect draft for Yahoo.